this book reminds you that dynamite comes in small packages. Amen. I want to read one passage of scripture. And while you're turning there, um, something that I, I failed to mention earlier in the announcement is right after church, um, there will, thank you, Sister Garza. I saw her walk in. Thank you. She's going to be brewing up a couple of pots of coffee or whatever they call those pump things. And uh, what'd you call them? I, a, a giraffe? Whatever it is. So um, they, um, we have two new blends of coffee in, one from Ethiopia and one from Tanzania. And they'll also be selling those. And then from here on out on Sundays after church, we're going to have some coffee made up in the back for you to go have a cup of coffee and mingle and hang out. And especially for our guests that come in and join us on Sundays, we want to make sure we can go back there and have a, a time of fellowship with them. Amen. So good to see brother and sister Strickland. They came all the way from San Francisco to hear me preach today. <laughs> No, no, a precious young lady has a birthday, and they're coming to be with her. Amen. Jude uh, chapter 1 and verse number 2, very short verse of Scripture. It says, Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Would you read that with me? Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Let's read that again. It's so short and it's so good. I don't know. I don't know how you can read that and not smile. So let's read that together. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now the New Living Translation says, "May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love." That's what we need: more mercy, more peace. And more love. Say, no, Pastor, we need more pipelines. No, we need more peace, more mercy, and more love. Because you know what? If you didn't love your neighbor at $2 a gallon, you ain't going to love them at $7 a gallon. And you weren't, if you weren't merciful, amen, when, when uh, ground beef was $2 cheaper a pound, you ain't going to be merciful now. That's why we need God to intervene and give us mercy and peace and love. Amen. I want to preach to you on this thought this afternoon. I really feel this in my heart, and I believe this is for more than just one person. I believe it's for all of us here today. And I want to preach on the house of multiplied mercies. The house of multiplied mercies. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now and let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your presence that we feel in such a great, a mighty, and a tremendous way. I pray, Lord, that you would use me, that you would help me, God, to be a blessing to these most precious of your chosen people. And I pray that I would be able to speak a word in season into somebody's life today. Lord, I pray that before we leave here, we will encounter you in a more rich and a more real way than we had when we first walked in. We thank you for what you've done and for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you thank the Lord again before you're seated? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And you can be seated. The Japanese tell a story about a house of a thousand mirrors. A small happy dog learned about this place and decided to visit. He was so happy to visit this place when it opened this house of a thousand mirrors that he ran straight up the stairs. His ears were lifted high and his tail was wagging just as fast as it could go. To his great surprise, he found himself staring at 1,000 other happy puppies with their tails wagging just like him. He smiled, a big smile, and winked at the other 1,000 puppies that were smiling at him. And he said to himself, as he left, he said, you know, this place is wonderful. This is the best place I've ever been to in my life. 
For every direction I looked, somebody was smiling at me, wagging their tail, ears perked up, and was happy to see me. I think I will visit this place every day that I shall live. Legend goes that in that same village, later on that day, there was another dog that wasn't happy like the first dog. He had the old Eeyore spirit on him. He heard about this house of a thousand mirrors. And so he decided that he would take a visit. So he moped his way into the house. Up the stairs, he drug his tail, ears hung low. Eyes drooping sad like an old basset hound. And as he looked into the house of a thousand mirrors, he saw a thousand unfriendly dogs. He showed his teeth and he growled. And a thousand dogs growled right back at him. And as he left, he grunted and whimpered, tail tucked between his leg and said, this is a horrible place and I will never come back here again. You see, the house was filled with nothing but mirrors. The law of the mirror is simply this. Mirrors only reflect what is set before them. Everybody I meet is rude, are they? Everybody's crazy, are they? I'm already preaching. I haven't even lifted my voice yet. Nobody likes me. Do they? Or are you just seeing yourself in everybody else? If you take that approach in trying to spread the gospel, mirrors only reflect what's set before them. See, I can, I can think of another house that had many, many mirrors. And this house is found in the Bible. It was, it was Solomon's house that he built for God. It was a house within a house. And within the house, there was an innermost house. And everything was overlaid with shining gold. The floors, the walls, the ceilings were all covered with pure shimmering, reflective gold. Solomon had built a house of many mirrors that everywhere you looked, you saw a reflection. In 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 19, in the New King James says, and he prepared the inner sanctuary inside the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold and overlaid uh, the altar of cedar. Verse 21, so Solomon overlaid the inside of the temple with pure gold. He stretched gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. The whole temple he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the temple. Also, he overlaid with gold the entire altar that was by the inner sanctuary. Now God's a bling-bling God. And you... You don't have to drape it on you. That's not the point. Uh -uh. It's, it's what's on the inside of you. Because the gold wasn't put on the outside of the temple. It was on the inside of the temple to reflect the glory of God out. That's what the Holy Ghost in you. It is pure gold. It is God's presence that reflects out of you the glory of God. The primary piece of furniture in the house, within the house, in the house, the Holy of Holies, was the Ark of the Covenant. Angelic wings had been fashioned out of beaten gold that reached across a blood-splattered mercy seat. 
Mirrors, remember, only reflect what is set before them. What these walls and ceilings and floors of gold, what did they reflect? I'll tell you what they reflected. They all reflected the mercy seat where God showed his mercy, his covenant of mercy to mankind. Everywhere that the priest looked inside that innermost room in that holy of holies, everywhere he looked, he saw mercy because when he looked in that room, it was the blood reflected reflected off of the mercy seat on the ceiling and on the walls and on the floor. Everywhere the high priest looked, he saw mercy. He saw mercy to the east and mercy to the west. He saw mercy to the north and mercy to the south. He saw mercy in the highest and he saw mercy in the lowest. He saw mercy in the well-lit places and in the dim-lit places. Everywhere that the priest looked, he saw the mercy and the blood of God. I pray this afternoon that everywhere we look, we begin to see the mercy of God. I don't care how illicit their lifestyle. I don't care how bound by drugs they are. Our lives need to be a reflection of the blood of Jesus Christ. If God did it for me, he'll do it for them. If he saved me, he'll save them. If he forgave me, he'll forgive them. Because the house of God was the place where mercy resides. And understand, it's not just simple mercy for one occasion. It's not one strike and you're out. It's not fail me once and take you out. Oh no. In this house we find the mercy of God multiplied. In this house, the mercy of God is found in the altar. In this house, the mercy of God is found in the pulpit. In this house, the mercy of God is found in the baptistry. And in this house, the mercy of God, it must be found in the pew. And I'm so glad that I'm in a house. I'm so glad I'm in a place today where there is a mercy. Jude 1 and 2 says mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. That's why I want to preach to you this afternoon on the house of multiplied mercies. Because you're not just in a house of a single day of mercy, but you're in a house of multiplied mercy. If you only knew how many mercies it took God to get me where I am today. I, I don't know if you heard that. If you only knew how many mercies it took God to get me where I am right now. If you only knew the mercies of God it took for somebody to have their hands lifted, for somebody to have tears running down their face, then you would realize you are in a house of multiplied mercy. Somebody shout multiplied mercies. The word that describes God the most in the Bible is holy. Because God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the threefold anthem that the angels chant as they fly about the throne room. God has a character, and his character is holy. God reflects that character upon us, and God tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, he says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I'm to be a mirror. Amen. This isn't newfangled stuff. This is ancient doctrine preaching. We're supposed to be a reflection. Say, Pastor, I got to be a reflection of God's love, but it starts with being a reflection of God's holiness. I can, I can never be as holy, but I can be a reflection of it. Amen. You look directly at, at, at somebody. I, I made a mistake of doing this one time. If you look at somebody welding, I, I, we, in high school we had welding classes. They don't do that anymore. I used to criticize it until I see the way we're raising kids, and I don't blame them. I'm just being truthful. Amen. But we're about five years from every person under 30 being, only being able to use sporks. Not all, just, just, just a lot. <laughs> 
Y'all know what sporks are, right? Okay. I, I didn't know if I lost everybody. But we were in, in shop class in high school. And that's about in the 10th grade. We welded around our house all the time. We had a farm. We had to weld up stuff. But it, it was either this or home ec. <laughs> and as a, as, a, as a boy, you weren't going in home ec. That, that wasn't even about to happen. No. No, I, I didn't live in the Bay Area. I, I lived back where they, they, they would have took you out behind the field house and straightened you out. And, uh, but when we got our senior year, we did go to home ec, and so uh, for, for different reasons. Anyway, we had shop class, and, and we, had to learn, they, they would, we would do welding in there. Can, can you imagine today a bunch of 15-year-olds welding in high school? You know, thanks to the lawyers, they could never do that. Too many lawsuits. But I think we ought to get back to stuff like that. Say, well, they'll hurt themselves. They'll hurt themselves once. <laughs> That's how we learned. Dad, how's the spark plug work? He said, stick your finger in there. As I stand before God, this happened. He said, well, stick your finger in there. I said, well, what will it do? He goes, put your finger in there. I'll show you how it works. Put my finger in there. He hit the start button on the fork. I found out real fast how that thing worked. I never stuck my finger in another spark plug with a key in there again. That's abuse. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. Amen. Now, I'm not telling you to hand your kids a pair of tweezers and tell them to stick it in the wall, see what happens. But my goodness, we coddle. Amen. We, we're going to have a major shortage of people that can actually do functional things before too long. And they said, they said uh, we, well, we were in welding class, and I got a little distracted, and I forgot to put my shield down. And I started welding. Well, it only took a few seconds before I realized I had not had my shield down. I mean, it wasn't long at all. I didn't sit around and whistle Dixie for two verses. I mean, I found out real fast. And I whipped that thing down, and I, and I finished. And I was in the hospital that night, blisters on my eyes. I put patches on, put all kinds of, you know what I'm talking about? It's no bueno. It, it don't feel good. For a week, every time I blinked, it felt like sandpaper. My eyelids felt like sand. I'd, I'd, I'd cooked my eyes. You look directly at it, it'll fry your eyes right out of the sockets. But if you hold up a mirror, if I hold up a mirror, that's what the shop instructor would do every once in a while. If he didn't have a shield, he'd just grab a hand mirror and he'd look in his hand mirror to check our, our weld. See, that's why we're to reflect the holiness of God. Because if God just said, I'm going to show the world how holy I am, he'd torch us. His holiness is too strong. It's too powerful. That's why even the angels cover their faces with their wings and cry, holy, 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 because he's so holy. But you know what God allows us to do? He fills us with the pure gold of the Holy Ghost, and he allows us to reflect Amen. That's why in 1 Chronicles 6, uh, 16 and 29, uh, that's why we are commanded to worship God uh, in the beauty of holiness. Uh, we lift up holy hands. Uh, we lift up holy hearts. Uh, we lift up holy worship to a holy God. Uh, God reflects his holiness uh, upon how we serve him and how we worship him. I'm so glad that we serve a holy God that shines his holiness into our life. Can you shout amen? Another word to describe God. A man deals with his mercy. A man, God is holy is the most uh, used description of God. And right along beside it is God is merciful. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 3, the apostle Paul called God the father of mercies. The father of mercies. The father, of, if you're not merciful, you've got a different daddy than I got. If you're not merciful, you've got a different father than I got because my father is the father of mercy. Wherefore, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, saith God, and you shall be my people and I shall be your God and I shall be a father unto you. If you want mercy in your life, you gotta show mercy because your God is the father of mercies. 
Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. We're told, we are told in Scripture, amen, that we are to praise God for his mercy 41 times in the Old Testament. Psalms 136 tells us 26 times his mercy endureth forever. 26 times we are reminded to praise God for his goodness. 26 times we are reminded that God is merciful because he is good. 26 times we are reminded that God is a giver of mercy. 26 times we are reminded that we are here today because of God's mercy. I'm glad that I serve a God of mercy and that I'm in a house of multiplied mercies. Oh, somebody go ahead and praise him because his mercy endures forever. It's important to note that it's not just a singular mercy, amen, but it is mercies, plural. God does not have one mercy. He has many mercies. In fact, God has multiplied mercies. God is not poor in any area. He is not impoverished in any area, but he is abundant in all areas. And Ephesians chapter two and verse four says, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loves us. Amen, God is rich in mercy. An infinite God with infinite goodness chooses to multiply his mercies upon his people. You see, he is a God of a multiplied mercies. It doesn't matter if you fail once or twice or a thousand times. I'm glad I serve a God of mercy that lifts me up again. If it weren't for his grace, if it weren't for his mercy, none of us would be here today. Somebody shout multiplied mercies. Amen. Multiplied. Not just a few but many multiplied abundant amount of mercies, praise God. Nehemiah chapter nine and verse 17 in the latter part says, but thou art a God ready to pardon. And that was in the Old Testament. Thou art a God who is ready to pardon. The sooner we quit seeing God as Barney Five with a ticket book, Come on, the sooner we stop seeing God as Barney Five with a ticket book ready to write us a ticket for every little thing we've done. Uh, you go to hell, you go to hell, you go to hell. You, that's not God. He is ready, but he's ready to pardon. I said he's ready, but he's ready to pardon. He's ready, but he's ready to pardon. As soon as you're willing to ask, as soon as you're willing to seek forgiveness, as soon as you're willing to repent, he is ready to pardon us our sin. But thou art God are ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Isaiah 55 and 7, the prophet says, let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have a mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. He's not just going to pardon you, but he's going to abundantly pardon you. Now, I know there are people in the world, uh, amen, that might be done with you, but God ain't done with you. There may be people in your family done with you, but God ain't done with you. People in your neighborhood, in your circle, and on your job may be ready to write you off, uh, but God's not ready to write you off uh, because he is a God uh, of multiplied mercies. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody shout multiplied mercies. God, God's mercies are great and he multiplies them to those that are in need. Amen. He multiplies them to those that are in need. If you're in need of his mercy this afternoon, I want you to know something. You ain't got to beg for it. You don't got to do backflips for it. You ain't got to pay penance for it. All you got to do is ask for it. And mercy is as far as away as the opening of your mouth and the confession of your heart. Amen. And he will display mercy. He didn't die on 
a cross so he could be cruel. He didn't resurrect from a grave so he could be mean. He didn't ascend into the heavenly so he can be distant from your plea. He wants to live not just with you but in you. And the only way he can do that is if you cry out for mercy. Amen. Because, because I had an older brother, or have an older brother, but when I was young, um, we played a game called Mercy. Some of y'all act like you know what I'm talking about. How I many of you fellows know, know what I'm talking about, Mercy? And uh, we played it a lot. I, I say we played it a lot. They played Mercy a lot on me. Amen. All them wrestling moves they watched. My favorite wrestler was Hulk Hogan, but I had to be the Iron Sheik and all the bad guys because they were trying the stuff out on me. And they'd play Mercy. For those of you that are not informed and you've not had the privilege to live through the game Mercy, it's where the greatest amount of torture can be inflicted on your body until you can no longer take it and you cry out, and when you say mercy, the rule is they got to stop unless they're an older brother or his friends. And they push you past that point a little bit more, and then they rub it in and, and say something like, if you tell mama, I'll stab you in your sleep or something like that. <laughs> because the game of mercy, mercy was there's going to be some pain come your way, but there's going to be a limit to that pain. As soon as it becomes unbearable, and in my case, until I can almost hear the bones cracking, ligaments tearing, muscles ripping, then you'd say, mercy, and they'd let go, supposedly, most of the time, <laughs> depending on if mom and daddy were home. And when you said mercy, and they let go, and then they giggle, <laughs> like they won. Well, everybody's going to cry out for mercy at some point. You don't win because you inflicted pain. You win because you knew what to say to get out of it. <laughs> Some of you are hurting so bad right now, and you're just trying to gut it out and tough it out, and you don't even realize you're not winning because you got sweat running down your brow. You're not winning because you're allowing the devil to break the bone in your elbow. You're not winning because he's got you twisted up like a pretzel. You're not winning because he's rolled you up in a full Nelson. No, you're not winning. You're going to win the moment you realize all you got to do is say, Mercy. Mercy, and here's the good news. If hell doesn't let go, daddy is going to pay him in spades if he don't let go. You see, all you are is a cry of mercy away from the enemy backing up off of your life because God said he would never put more on you than you are able to bear. And what you need to start doing is saying mercy. God have mercy, mercy, mercy. I don't think I can handle much more, God. I've been dealing with this enough and if you cry out for mercy you'll find out that your father is the father of all mercies <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah oh I feel the Holy Ghost this afternoon you, you ain't got to bear that on your own just cry out for mercy. I found the best way to fix things is not try to fix them. Let God handle them. God multiplies his mercies to people that need them. If you're in great need of mercy, you can have it. There's not some formula or program you got to go through. David said in 1 Chronicles 21 and 13, he said, I am in great distress. Maybe I'm not preaching to anybody here. He said, I'm in great, I'm, I'm not talking about sitting at the pump, griping about, I'm talking about great distress. Have you ever been in great distress before? 
You, no, I'm talking about great distress. You're at the end of the month. You ain't got no more money. You're one eviction notice away. I'm talking about great distress. Great distress. If they ever find out. I, I need, are there any real people in this place? Because I... I know we want to act sanctified on Sunday like we ain't got problems, but I'm talking about real distress. If they ever find out who I really am and what I really struggle with and what I'm really dealing with and what I'm really fighting and the bitterness I have in me and the depression and the loneliness and the anxiety and the fear and the worry and the stress, if they ever knew what I was going through, they might not let me back in this place. But the moment you're willing to say, I'm in great distress, I need mercy, he's willing to give it. David said, I'm in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. David said, when I fall, it's not if I fall, but when I fall, let me fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is greater than the mercy of men. His compassion is greater than the compassion of man. I'm preaching about a God of multiplied mercies. See, the problem we get into is we think if we preach about mercy and grace, we're just preaching to sinners. People that have never, oh, no, no. I'm preaching to a house full of sinners right now. Matter of fact, I wish I had a giant mirror in front of me. I'd be preaching to another big sinner. We all, the, the, the day you think you don't need the mercies of God, dear Lord. I need them every day I live. David said, I'm in distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercies are very great. I don't think we, we would even have a debate if we talked about what a great sinner David was. Dave, David didn't have hiccups. He had car wrecks. No, no, he didn't have car wrecks. He had plane crashes. Oh, forget that. He had nuclear submarine eruptions. I'm still talking about the shouting David we talked about a minute ago. That David who knew how to shout in the temple also fall flat on his face when he walked out. This isn't a license to do it. I'm just trying to give you some character reference here. He, David's not the guy you want moving in in your neighborhood, especially if you got a good-looking wife. You don't want him moving in your neighborhood with a good-looking wife and you going out of town. Because he killed one guy. I'm still talking about shouting, dancing, David. And David said, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. In other words, David said, my sin is great. I've trespassed against God. I violated his commandments. My sin is great, but his mercy is very great. For where sin doth abound, doth grace much more abound. His mercies, his mercies are many and he enlarges them to cover the need. No matter what you've done and no matter what you need, God has a mercy for you today. Isaiah 55 and three, he says, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the Sure mercies of David. Ooh. Almost nothing in life is sure, but this is sure. His mercy. His mercy endureth forever. I'm going to say something right here. All sin has an expiration date. I'm going to say it again. All sin.
has an expiration date. When you open up that refrigerator, when you get home, that milk has an expiration date. But somehow, grandma's canned beans probably still work from 1950. <laughs> that canned chicken noodle soup's gonna expire at some point. But kind of like them army military MREs, they'll probably outlast nuclear winter. I've eaten MREs from the Vietnam era, and they still tasted good. The crackers were terrible. We had canned sea rations, came in an old car one time. We, from World War II, we opened up and ate a little bit out of there. Surprised we lived with all the preservatives they had in that stuff. Sin has an expiration date. One of these days, oh, I feel good right now. Sin is going to cease. Because God is going to relegate it to the lake of fire and he's going to nuke it with everlasting. But just because sin stops and expires, God's mercy never expires for it endureth. God's mercy will last longer than you will have the ability to need it. You're not going to need God's mercy in heaven. You're not going to need God's mercy in the millennial reign. You're not going to need God's mercy a billion years from now. But God's mercy will still be moving. And it'll still be working. And it'll still be powerful. And it'll still work. Because God's mercy is going to outlast your sin. Oh, go ahead and shout to him if you believe that. God's mercies are sure mercies. If you trust him today, you can hold on to these sure mercies in your life. Hallelujah. There are countries in where public transportation is the primary method of travel. And uh, I think they're trying to maybe force us into that stuff maybe with all these gas prices and stuff. But there are countries where public transportation is the primary method of travel and it seems that in the city there everyone takes the bus. If you I've been privileged to be in some of these cities and I have been very unfortunate to be on some of those buses. And in many of these countries the vast majority of the time the bus is completely packed. And, and you have to stand. I, I, I don't know if you've ever been in one of those situations, but I, I have been in there where you are crammed in. Like, so I don't like people touching me. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not funny. I'm just not, I just, just okay, homie, don't play that. I just don't want people touching me. I, I, don't, I don't care what color, gender, stripe you are. It doesn't matter to me. I, don't, I, I, I got married to the one person I won't touch me, and that's it. <laughs> and you get in these public transportation situations, and they all up in your business. I mean, and, 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 and they're not even considerate whether they took a shower or not. Whether they, I mean, whether they put on deodorant or not, whether they brush their teeth or not. It, it get, and you're crammed in there, and, and they got this bar, and you hold on to that bar, and everybody's reaching up, holding on to that bar, and nobody found the deodorant now. You can call me whatever, but I've been there. And uh, as much as I don't like people touching me, I don't like smelling people. I sat beside an old hippie one time on a flight and bless her soul, that body had never met warm water. It was bad. I'm telling you, it was bad. And uh, I only thought it was bad sitting there, but when she reached up to scratch her head, I'm telling you, when she reached up to scratch her head, it looked like she had Cheech and Chong in the headlock. 
there was hair coming out everywhere. And it was matted. Now, we say, oh, she was poor. She wasn't poor. Uh Uh-uh. She had a Gucci purse. She was just making a statement. The problem was I had to smell that statement. I was on public transportation in the Philippines in Manila, and we were all crammed in like that. And I'm t- it was hot. It's always hot there. They only have two seasons in the Philippines, hot and very hot. <laughs> and it was hot. And we're in there, and you can't hardly breathe. But, but I've learned something. Paul said, no matter where I go there, therewith, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be content to take salt and always have an atomizer of cologne on me. And we're like this, and I'm telling you, because I'm about a foot taller than everybody, and heat rises. And I'm holding on to that thing, and there's no sense in going, did, did you not put on deodorant? Because nobody did. And, and we're talking about business people, whatever. And so I'll just sleep, I'll grab like this, and I'll reach in the inside of my shirt pocket or wherever, and my lapel pocket, and I'll pull that thing out, and everybody's looking at their phones, and they're holding on, we're cramming, and I start going, ch 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 I'm telling you, as I stand before God, it happens all the time. And all of a sudden, people start looking at me going, oh. <laughs> Very pleasant white guy. <laughs> it smells really good. I'm just. I'm, I'm baptizing everybody. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> One of the first revivals I preached, I had to take Greyhound. And, and Oh, Lord, have mercy. If you ever took Greyhound, you know what I'm talking about. You ever take Grand Helm before? Hallelujah. That place can be packed out and there's eight teeth on the whole bus. <laughs> and this old guy beside me fell asleep and I am t- it was bad. And I just, I pulled out my cologne bottle and I bathed that joker. I said, I probably used a quarter of that bottle just bathing him while he was asleep. I couldn't get out. I was pinned in. I took the cologne and started wiping it under my nose, up in my nose. For long, all I could smell was, I think it was Herrera back then. I was wearing, and I had Herrera, or, or no, it was a uh, uh, Gavinci pie. I had Gavinci pie all up in my nose, all on my upper lip. I bathed that guy in that. About 45 minutes later, I watched him. He, he, I had my Walkman on, listening to It's back when we didn't have phones where you had, you, you had cords you plugged into a CD player and you couldn't let it bounce or it'd mess up. And I, I saw the guy, and he woke up, and he, he woke up like this and went, And he felt good about himself. <laughs> and I, I was holding on to this bar. And, and, and you get in the public transportation, you hold on to that bar. And then you find out that just as bad as it is inside the bus, it's even worse on the outside of the bus. Because, because the traffic is atrocious. And, and road conditions are, are, are they're absolutely horrendous. Potholes that, that t- just two inches deeper, and they would make them a national monument as a Grand Canyon. I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking about bad, bad condition. Amen. And, you, and you've got to stand there, and you've got to hold on, and every bus driver thinks that they are Mario Andretti, or, or they think that they are a NASCAR driver, and they're whipping through. And if that's not bad enough, every once in a while, you'll hear a bump because they think they're in a demolition derby. And consequently, passengers are holding on to the rail with everything that they have. And so that when the driver whips around the car and that bus is supposed to hold 80 people, and I'm not exaggerating, there's over 200 in that bus. And you're holding on there and you're just whipping around like this. And and you're holding, you realize that the only thing that's going to keep you from spilling into the floor and making a mess of everything is that you are held on to something that is fixed into the frame of the bus. That no matter how many swerving bus drivers, no matter how many any potholes, no matter how many curbs they jump, people they run over, you've got to hold on with everything you have because if you slip, you're going to get hurt, you're going to hurt somebody else, you're going to wreck, they may wreck on the outside, but you'll wreck the inside, but you realize your only hope is holding on to something that is 
surely fix that will not move and if you're going to survive in living for God sometimes it's going to get smelly sometimes it's going to get bumpy sometimes it's going to throw you around but the only way you're going to survive honey is you better learn to hold on to the sure mercies of God you better there's going to be days in your life you're going to hit some bumps there's going to be days in your life you're going to be thrown from side to side but my brother my sister you better hold on to the mercies of God Psalms 119 and 156, David says, Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. In the NIV, he says, Preserve my life according to your laws. In other words, David said, I'm going to hold on to your mercies with everything I have because the preservation of my life is found when I hold on to something that is sure. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground, I'm telling you, Jesus, is the sure mercy that your life needs. Jesus is the sure mercies. Mercies are what gives you life. And when this world has sucked all the life out of you, the mercies of God, breathe back into you life. Psalms 103 and 4 says, Who hath redeemed thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Did you know that mercy makes a crown? Did you know some of you are wearing crowns today? I'm not talking about a little tinker tiara you get at Claire's. I'm talking about a real crown. Matter of fact, if you look hard enough, I'm, I'm wearing a pretty big old crown up here today. That's what David said. That's who crowneth thee, who crowneth thee, who crowneth thee, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. I'm wearing a crown. You're wearing a crown. But it's not a crown of success. It's not a crown of wealth. It's not a crown of who's the best or the most popular. But it is a crown of the mercies of God. And when people look at you, they see you as a child of the king. Why? Because you're wearing the crown of a child of God who's wearing the mercies of God on their life. You see, there are those here today who shouldn't even be alive. How do you know? Because I can see their crown. There are those here today that should be dead from drug overdoses from alcohol addiction, from car wrecks, from gang violence, you name it, but they're not dead today. You want to know why? Because they're crowned with tender mercies and love or kindness. Hallelujah. 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 I wear his mercy as a crown. I don't hide it beneath my coat and act like I don't need it. I put it on top of my head for everybody to see if it wasn't for the Lord who was on my side. If it wasn't for his precious blood that was shed on Calvary. If it wasn't for his forgiveness and his redemption. If it wasn't for his mercy, I wouldn't be here today in a house of multiplied mercies. Oh, hallelujah. God's merciful. Somebody shout, God's merciful. Look at somebody and say, God multiplies his mercy. Because as the rivers look for the sea and the sun looks for the earth, mercy is looking for you. Because mercy has an object and you are that object. God wants to multiply his mercies on you. In times of great need, nothing speaks to the heart of man like Psalms does. And in Psalms 130 and 1 through 8, David writes and he says, Out of the depths I have cried unto thee, O Lord. 
Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to my, the voice of my supplication. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who should stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they which watch for the morning. I say more than they which watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. And with him is plenteous redemption and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. In other words, David said, God, if you were going to mark iniquities, who would be able to stand before you? But what you're looking for, you're not trying to mark me out. You're trying to mark me in. And the way you mark me in is when I say have mercy, have mercy. You are in a house of multiplied mercy, and it doesn't matter where you are in your walk with God. There's still more mercy for you. Come on, somebody shout to the Lord this afternoon. I've come to, I'm closing, but I've come to say this. For multiplied miseries, there is multiplied mercies. For multiplied pain, there is multiplied mercies. Hallelujah. 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 Is there anybody in this place that needs mercy today? You see, Romans 12 and 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul said, I'm appealing to you by God's mercy. Live sacrificially and holy and acceptable unto God. For every second of the minute, there's mercy. For every minute of the hour, there's mercy. For every hour of the day, there's mercy. For every day of the week, there's mercy. For every week of the month, there's mercy. For every month in the year, there's for every year in the decade, there's for every decade in the century, there's for every century in the millennium, there's mercy. Mercy. Lamentations 3 and 22 through 23, and I'm going to try to close here. He said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy For every day you live before your feet hit the floor, God has already measured out more than sufficient mercy for your day. And you will never be able to exhaust that mercy. Would you stand with me? I, I, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what sin you might be dealing with today. I don't know what struggle is happening in your life financially, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. I, I, don't, I don't know every, but you know who does know? God knows. And though I were to prophesy and speak into detail every situation in your life, 
it would not bring you one step closer to God's amazing mercy. You know what I see? I see a house of multiplied mercy today. Every direction I look in, Sister Tanya, I just see a smiling puppy. Every direction I look, I see another opportunity of mercy and hope. But Pastor, if you only knew my struggle, well, I spent 45 minutes trying to tell you if you only knew his mercy. We baptized a man several years ago in Santa Maria. Hispanic man didn't speak two words of English. He was involved in all kinds of I don't even want to go into detail some stuff in Mexico. Really bad stuff. Human smuggling, all that stuff. And he came into the church and I was preaching on baptism which seemed to be a theme when I evangelized. I preach on baptism a lot. And uh, he came to the altar. He came to the altar, a altar, a Catholic. He left him, born again. He had prayed. He had prayed to every saint, every statue you could imagine. He got him in the water. And we're saying through the translator everything that's going to happen. And right before Pop Keys took him down, I, you remember this, babe? I'll never forget this. He looked up and he said, he said, Pastor, he said it through the translator. It was Brother Fred. He said, when you put me under the water, can you hold me under there for just a few seconds? And Pop looked at him and said, I mean, tears just running, dead, just dripping into the baptistry. He said, well, why would we do that? And he just wept. And he said, because I've got a lot of sin in my life. And I want to make sure it stays there. His name was Juan Baptista. Which being interpreted is? And that is name. His son's a young preacher in that church now. <laughs> he said, hold me under there a little bit longer. Because <laughs> I messed up so bad. Oh, it ripped my heart out to hear somebody say that. I'll never get Pop telling him, he said, oh, Juan, it's, it's not about the length of time you're under that water, son. Because as soon as we invoke the name Jesus, God's mercy takes every sin out of your life. Some of you think God is holding you under for a while because you've messed up so much and God ain't doing it. No, no, no. He's just waiting on you to cry out for mercy. He's just waiting on you in your situation right now and your loneliness and your fear and your depression and your anxiety and all of the stress of life and the turmoil and the sickness and the pain and the sin. He's just waiting for you right now to say, God, I need mercy. I need mercy. And if anybody in this place needs mercy, I've come to tell you, you've come to the right house because this is the house of a thousand mirrors. This is the house of multiplied mercies. Hallelujah.
in this altar there's golden ceiling, a golden floor and golden walls and all I can see is the blood I just see the blood to the north, the south and the east and the west the blood of Jesus is radiating throughout this altar right now, is there anybody is there anybody that wants to come to the mercy seat of God say pastor if I go they're going to think I'm a sinner, that's why I got here first because ain't a bigger sinner in this place than me all of us have sinned and come short of the glory pastor if I go down they're going to think I'm back so, no, 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 no then, then you don't need to come into the house of a thousand mirrors but once you need mercy you're not going to care you don't care who it is who's looking, who's not there you're going to run to that altar and say God I need the blood I need the blood in my life I need multiplied mercies in my life come on, come on, come on come on, he's moving in this place right now this is a house a multiplied mercy come on, come on, come on lift that voice, lift those hands he's moving in this place right now there's healing in the mercies of God there's salvation in the mercies of God somebody's going to leave here and depression is going to lift off of you before you leave here today you hear your pastor right now you're going to leave here and that fog of fear is going to lift up off of your mind that laying awake at night that fretting over the checkbook and wondering how you're going to make two ends meet the mercies of God are in this place and it's because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed for his compassions fail not Come on, I feel the compassion of Almighty God. I feel the Father of mercies in this place right now. Cry out for mercy. Yes, yes. Yes, there's mercy, everlasting mercy, forever reaching mercy.